Coming up on Chopper's Politics. I think uh, warning notes on Shakespeare or something. Is that people being overprotective of people who don't need the protection? I think that those in a position of responsibility should be teaching young minds how to think, not what to think. I'm Christopher Chopper Hope, The Telegraph's Associate Editor for Politics. And this is Chopper's Politics. Well, MPs leave Westminster this week for their Easter holidays, but before they scatter off to the four winds in their constituencies, like pupils leaving school at the end of a school day, I've managed to persuade the Education Secretary, Nadeem Zahawi, to join us in the Red Lion pub. More on that later. But first, as MPs tuck into their Easter eggs, will Boris Johnson be entering the parliamentary recess with a spring in his step? Just as Britain's reaction to the conflict in Ukraine seemed to have rescued the PM's reputation, this week saw the spectre of so-called Partygate rear its head once again. To help us make sense of it all and where it leaves Boris Johnson, I'm joined by The Telegraph's political editor, Ben Riley-Smith. Ben, welcome to the pub. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Good. Now, listen, it's... It's been snowing where I live in Hertfordshire today, but in the countryside, lambs are skipping, Easter eggs are being eaten next week, daffodils are swaying in the breeze. But will the PM resign over Partygate? I would be amazed if he will resign over Partygate, so I think it's pretty simple to say no. Certainly had no indication of that, even at the height of Partygate, which was late Jan, early Feb, when this kind of succession of revelations was rolling and Tory MPs were going public and calling on him to resign. We are in a very different place now politically, fundamentally because Russia invaded Ukraine. There is now a European war playing out. It feels very different. And when you talk to Tory MPs, I think they feel the same. Andrew Bridgen has removed his no-confidence letter. Douglas Rush, the Scottish Tory leader, is no longer calling on him to resign. Even Sir Roger Gale, who's kind of the arch-critic of Boris inside the party, is suggesting that he's not in any real political danger now. So I think that the short answer to your question is no. He may not resign. Will he be forced to resign? Will there be a no-confidence vote in him from other Tory MPs upset if he's fined? I think not imminently. So as we remember with the rules, you need 54 Tory MPs to put in a letter of no-confidence to the 1922 committee. In late Jan, early Feb, when this was really coming to a head, Whips thought maybe it was in the 20s, maybe it was in the 30s. Of course, nobody knows quite for sure because it's all done very secretively. You hand your letter or email your letter to Sir Graham Brady, the chair of this committee, and he keeps it under lock and key. You'll only reveal if you hit that 54 figure. But if we were in the 20s, 30s, 40s back then, I don't think anybody thinks we're anywhere close to that now. So, I mean, the short answer is no, but there are things that could change that in the coming weeks and months, primarily whether Boris himself gets a fine. Yes, and if he were fined, he would still stay, would he? He, well, he won't resign if he's fined, that's pretty clear, but that might be... T- a step too far for some moderate Tory MPs who we haven't heard from yet. Well, that was always the line back at the beginning of the year that, well, there were two things they were fundamentally saying. One was, if the Prime Minister himself is fined, which means the Prime Minister is found by the police to have broken COVID laws, the laws he was setting for the rest of the country, Mm -hmm. then that would be a big thing that could sway some of them. The other one was, let's see what Sue Gray, the senior civil servant in the Cabinet Office, says about all of these events she was looking into. Now, her hands are tied effectively from revealing what she found out until the Met investigation ends. But that was always another moment when she would say, right, I'm free to say what happened at all of these events. We got her top line conclusions early in the year that seemed pretty damning, but we don't know the exact ins and outs. And when that eventually becomes public, that might also be a a changing point. And that grey initial uh, report or update, called an update, wasn't it, talked about failings of leadership. So anything further on that could be damaging. And of course, Boris Johnson has said that the, the, the full report we published when the police have finished their investigations, which could be months. And that brings us to Ukraine. So Boris Johnson has done really well over Ukraine. He's led or helped lead the West response robustly against Russia. But if Ukraine, you know, sorts itself out to a degree, I mean, you know, how that looks, I don't know. And, it, and it's his... It's, um, it's so sad and so serious, nothing like what we have in this country at the moment. But um, if that happens, then Boris Johnson becomes more at risk. Yeah, well, one of the things I take away from this is just how quickly the political dynamic in Westminster can change. It was eight, ten weeks ago when a dozen plus Tories were publicly saying Boris Johnson had to go. Any moment we thought there could have been a leadership vote, which is thumbs up, thumbs down, anonymously from all MPs and 
who would want to predict where that would have ended up? But now, two months later, totally different situation, largely because something well outside of this country has changed the dynamic. But who's to say something else won't change it in the next couple of months? And, you know, let's not get into predicting where the Ukraine-Russia war will end and these negotiations and how sincere Vladimir Putin is. But what we do know is next month, a huge cost of living smack in the face of the British people Mm. is coming with... Uh, the national insurance rise kicking in, council tax rise kicking in, with the government's helping on that front, energy bills jumping up, because that's Mm. when the increased price That's actually Friday this week, energy bills. Yeah. And then in five weeks' time, we have the May local elections where, if you believe the Tory spin, they are braced to do quite badly in that. So possibly May, June is going to be a tricky time politically for the Prime Minister. Um, And what we saw this week is the Met is not going to do one big reveal, here are all the fines. Actually, it could be a rolling wave of fines. They said, OK, we're doing 20 fines now. There could be more. The names could start dripping out. We could be told at some point that Boris has been fined. That's very much a kind of TBC. So political dynamics can change quite quickly. Philip Backer, we're about halfway through. If he serves the full five years or even, even well, four years, four and a half years, we're just over the halfway point of his first term or his last term as, as Prime Minister, if he goes to the next election, which may be May 24. How will history judge him? Well, number, I, I think by the huge issues he's had to tackle. So number one, I think, as the guy who delivered Brexit, he was the most prominent figure in the campaign. They won that campaign. He was then the Prime Minister who came in and did what Theresa May couldn't, mm-hmm. which was secure a deal that could get through Parliament, and partly he did that by winning his massive majority. And then secondly, the guy who steered the country through this once-in-a-century pandemic. I mean, just unprecedented those couple of years, you know, economic drop like we haven't seen for 300 years, and effectively telling, ev- well, literally telling everyone to stay at home and not meet anybody unless they had to. So steering the country through that, and there'll be debates about how well he did that. I think those are the two huge bits of his current legacy. The one that he wants to do is to be this great reforming PM who reshaped the political landscape and levelled up parts of the country that have been um, in... And that's the problem. That, that, that's where the problem is. That's a huge it? problem. That legacy issue hasn't really yet been resolved how it might be delivered. No, exactly. I mean, two years ago when Brexit had been secured, it became a kind of, OK, now we can focus on the reforms. Then they got hit by COVID. That dominated the next two years. And then earlier this year, it was like, right, OK, we can pivot the big levelling up white paper. We can get back to our reforms. And then the Ukraine invasion happened. I mean, literally the press conference that Boris Johnson said, right, all COVID restrictions are lifting. At the very end of it, he said, OK, and now I've just got to talk to Vladimir Zelensky yes. about what's happening in Ukraine and immediately into this other yes, huge... Yes, five-hour window between the end of restrictions <laughs> in England and the start of war in Europe. So that's just the reality. So they want to be pushing on with these reforms, but the dominant issue is still uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and will be for the foreseeable. So there's a, And it actually gets into that issue of cutting taxes that the Tories keep telling us they want to do. But if the cost of living crisis keeps escalating, fueled by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, then it's always just on the horizon in mean, yeah. six months' time, in six months' time. And, and that will have an impact on how Tories are feeling the leadership is doing. Yeah, tax cutting matters, doesn't it? I mean, Rishi Sunak said this, said this week, didn't he, that he never said he's a tax cutter. That supplied an attack line for Keir Starmer, which I think would have worried Tory MPs. Yeah, so Rishi Sunak is clearly desperate, even though in that committee appearance he kind of said, oh, I never called myself a, a tax cutting chancellor. He is endlessly telling us about he's a kind of low tax Tory at heart and he wants to get cutting taxes. The problem he has, and he's pretty explicit about it, is we have huge borrowing because of COVID and interest rates are ticking up. So they revealed at the spring statement he needs to pay £83 billion just to service the debt that the government has. So they want to bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, while somehow cutting taxes while keeping spending high. So it's very hard to balance all these things. So you had this slightly weird spring statement where they're increasing national insurance, but they're increasing the threshold of national insurance so people don't start paying it as early. They are freezing the income tax thresholds, which means uh, people are getting dragged into income tax while also saying, oh, in a couple of years' time, I'll also cut income tax. It was so this strange contorted <laughs> position, because they know most Tory MPs, most Tory voters want low tax, but they can't deliver it immediately. And they're trying to indicate the future, subject to all, all other things happening, which, of course, no one knows what they are in two years' time. I'm just finally, Ben Riley-Smith, and thank you for joining us today. Put your cards on the table. Will Boris Johnson fight the next election? 
Oh, God, we always stick clear predictions as reporters. And no one's listening. You and me in the pub, and the reason. No one's listening to this. <laughs> I would say I'm much more confident he will now than two months ago. I mean, two months ago, it really looked pretty dicey. When you have the leader of your own Scottish party calling for you to go, then you begin to think whether he can make it. Uh, but he's certainly in a much more stable position now than he was then. Is that a yes or a no? I'm not going to give a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a politician now. Ben Riley smith once again, thanks for joining us this week on Troubles Politics. Great to have you on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And for more of Ben's expert analysis, why not become a Telegraph subscriber? Please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get your first month's access to our website completely free of charge. Do stay with us, listeners. Right after this, we have Education Secretary Nadim Zahawi on snowflakes, colonialism and cutting taxes. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this, and click follow so you don't miss an update. Now, ordinarily, releasing a 60-page education white paper would be front-page news for days and days for a government. But these aren't ordinary times. With a war in Europe, it's been difficult for Nadim Zahawi to push his policy out there. But the education of the future of this country is obviously vitally important at all times. And with me now in the pub is Nadim Zahawi, the Education Secretary. Nadim, welcome. It's wonderful to be with you. That's been a big week for your department, hasn't it? The school's white paper in any run of any government, that's a big week. Why do schools need another revolution if the Tories have been in power for 12 years? So when we came into office in coalition, the really big step change that Michael Gove led in the department on is the academy program. Mm. So it really accelerated the adoption of schools into academies, that has been successful. So if you look at the evidence, when we came into office, 68, so two thirds of schools were good or outstanding. That's now 86%, you know, big, big difference. The evidence is clear that families of schools in a strong, high-performing multi-academy trust, and I underline high-performing, uh, deliver better outcomes for their students. I'm very fond of reminding people of my own backstory, coming here at the age of 11, couldn't speak a word of English, having parents who had the wherewithal to understand the value of education, what it unlocks for you in terms of opportunity. I want the system to work for every child, even those whose parents don't have the wherewithal or have no parents at all. Now, how are we going to do that is to really complete the journey. We are about to announce our 10,000th academy out of a school system in England of 22,000 schools. That's real scale. What's the evidence? The evidence is the families of schools that are really tightly managed in a high-performing multi-academy trust have really delivered, actually reinforced through COVID because that family structure of schools help those schools cope much better. Because well, share resources and share learning. Share resources, uh, support, online learning tools, all the things that teachers, head teachers tell me that they actually benefited from. And so what the white paper does is take all that evidence, shares it, with parents. I've written it deliberately. I, I went back and looked at all the previous white papers. And the danger in any department is we, we, we speak in jargon. There's lots of acronyms. Mm. And I wanted this to be very much a document that parents can pick up. It's relatively short and they can read it and they would understand it. And so it's called Opportunity for All, a strong school with an excellent teacher for your child. Right. That's what parents want. They want their child to go to a really good school that's well supported and have a really great teacher. The greatest determinant, by the way, of outcome, back to you know, what we've done uh, since we came into office, is the quality of teacher. Right? And one of the things I'm building on is the half a million teacher training opportunities. So we've got 461,000 teachers in our 22,000 schools, 
270,000 teaching assistants. If that teacher is really well qualified, so the early careers framework, as it's called, which is the early qualification for teachers, the initial teacher training, the further in career development, we've evidenced through Michael's, again, Michael endowed the Educational Endowment Foundation, the EEF, um, to evidence what really high quality teacher qualifications should be. And now I'm accelerating that, a quarter of a billion to deliver half a million teacher training opportunities. Why are unions unhappy with what you're doing then, if you want to increase uh, the skill level of their members? So the Association of uh, School and College Leaders have been really heavily engaged with us. They, I think, think actually there's a lot in this white paper that they can... Um, uh, but the NEU, NEU is less happy? The, the, the NEU is less happy, and I try and work with them wherever possible by presenting the evidence. Unfortunately, uh, they have misrepresented the data. I've made it very clear, and I've just said it to you, that when you look at high-performing multi-academy trusts, they deliver better outcomes. There is no doubt in that, right? Uh, there are some multi-academy trusts that aren't high-performing, and I know how I'm going to get them to be high-performing because we can now define what attributes create a high-performing multi-academy trust. And I think it's unfortunate that they uh, 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 you know, took the evidence and said, oh, actually, it's, it's not what And they hate they targets, say. they hate comparing schools against schools, and they don't like the idea of, which some parents might applaud, by the way, of increasing people's leaving at year six with these minimum standards of reading and writing to 90% from so, 65%. They're it, exactly not happy right. with that. Exactly right. So, so one of the things that we need to improve is literacy and numeracy. You know, until I began to read English, to write in English, and to think in English, I didn't know that I might be quite good at maths or chemistry or human biology. And so you need those basics right. At the moment, only two-thirds of primary school children, complete primary school, being able to do English and maths to an adequate standard. My target is to get that to 90%. And then we've got a equally ambitious target for secondary school. So we're going to lift the average in English and maths from 4.5 to 5. Now, it sounds modest, but when you look at the data, it means every child has to move up. So the lowest third need to move up. The top performing children need to go from grade 8 to 9, and also those on the border, so 4 to 5. But the reason I wanted that target, because it allows the teacher to focus on the whole school, not just... Um, so they won't on, focus on, on the, those on, on the, the gifted line. children. Exactly, or the gifted children. So, look, targets are important. The parent pledge is important. We, we have a parent pledge where teachers will identify where the gaps are in English and maths for a student and share that with parents. Mm. That is really important. Why? Because actually, you know, parents need to understand how they can help their child through the national tutoring programme that is now on offer in every school. It used to be the privilege of, of you know, wealthier Mm. well-to-do parents, uh, more fortunate parents. Boris wanted it to be available to every child, and that's what we've done. Nadim Zahawi, do you think one of the problems in, in perhaps all of debate about teaching is that the voice of the parents is forgotten, that you have often vested interest defending their position and the pupil and, and their parents is not really in the conversation? So great teachers actually really do care about engaging with parents. I was at the Monega Primary School in Newham to launch the white paper, and I met the parents. Lots of parents turned up. And they said, the teachers here are brilliant because they tell us exactly what's happening with our child's education. What, what is it? It's extracurricular activities. It's discipline, behavior. It's attendance, right? When parents feel that the this, this school is really delivering for them, you know, in the morning, they make sure the child arrives in school. I've seen it in Hammersmith Academy, another brilliant head, Gary Kiniston, right? He says, Nadim, every child has to be supported, but every child should be equally stretched and challenged to do the best. Can you mandate that across all schools, though? So, so the way I'm doing it is you don't get high performance through regulation. The way you get high performance is to by evidencing it and then scaling, right? I did it on vaccine. I'm going to do it again here. We have to work out how do, I, how do we get every school into that high-performing family of schools. And what we try to do in the white paper is be very clear as to what makes a high-performing multi-academy trust, how are we gonna make sure that happens? But I need to carry everybody with me. So I've engaged with the Church of England schools, with Catholic schools, with Jewish Muslim schools, with our excellent 165 grammar schools, because 
their experience is equally important. Mm. I need them to feel as passionate as I do that the system needs to deliver for every child. You want to show best place. practice to other, other head teachers. And, and, and they're coming on this journey. And actually, the, you know, whether it's Paul Whiteman or the NAHT or mm. our school union, they're coming with us on the You mentioned the unions. Uh, how do you encourage the best people to become teachers? And how do you get them in? The big, big complaint has been more testing means more work for them, more admin, less teaching. So one of the, again, attributes of a, of a high-performing multi-academy trust is that support for teachers in making sure that the ability to deliver a great lesson with the content that's available to them through their multi-academy or through the Oak Academy. So one of the things we're doing, we're turning the Oak National Academy. The Oak National Academy was set up in the middle of the pandemic because we needed to go to online learning. And so it was set up by teachers for teachers uh, from the best evidence of you know quality lesson content and we're going to turn that into a national academy that is available to all teachers. They can pull that content down. Where do we get the idea from? From the best performing multi-academy trust. That's how this thing works. It's not difficult. When you see what works, the challenge is how do you scale it? You know, back to my vaccine challenge is how do I make sure all 22,000 schools have great teachers in them? So the teacher training that we're doing, quarter of a billion pounds on half a million teacher training opportunities will deliver that. How do you make sure that they've got the content? Well, Oak National Academy, the multi-academy trust. You mentioned grammar schools there. Was it 126 you mentioned? 165. 165. What happens to them? Do they become academies? So a number of them have already joined multi-academy trusts and are doing really well. And I've spoken about wanting their, their ethos, their DNA to spread through the system. I've got three great grammar schools in my constituency, Shakespeare's own school, uh, King Edward's school, Shottery Girls' school, and Ulster Grammar. And you know, they do incredible work with uh, their students. I want to see them do more of it within the multi-academy trust system. And what they want to see is obviously their ability to protect their characteristics, obviously for selection. That we are continuing to support. As I am protecting the special characteristics of, of our Church of England schools and Catholic schools. Will they stop being called grammars? No, they can still be called grammars. They can even set up, if they wanted to, a trust with other grammars. I, you know, I, I'm interested in everyone joining us because ultimately, I sit here as the beneficiary yes. of an incredible education. It's outcomes, system. as you say. It's, it's outcomes, 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 right? outcomes. Yeah, an immigrant boy from Iraq couldn't speak a word of English. It's Secretary of State for Education. Yeah. Right? We should be obsessive about outcomes. Not, oh, you know, is that structure something that, that may be too risky for me to, to, to take? No, we've evidenced what works. Now let's deliver it. Do you want more grammars to open? Some of your colleagues want more grammars. Sir Graham Brady in the past, Theresa May is quite keen on them. And I'm, I, I love what they do and I want their DNA to spread through yeah. uh, our school system. But actually, when you think of scale, you're back to, yeah. to, to vaccine. If I am every day, every week that there are children going to the 900 schools that are below good, right, that are inadequate in our system, is for me you know, a, a blighted future for those kids, right? A, a, an opportunity missed to deliver for those children. And ha- my focus has to be on, on scale. So right? you're against, so selection. Were, you're against were, selection? No, I'm not against selection at all. But nevertheless, the reality is the system that we have has 22,000 schools in it, 10,000 of which are in academies. How do I make sure the other 12,000 actually now migrate and, of course, into high-performing multi-academy trusts? Because that's how I'm going to get... Scale matters. My mantra in the department is don't try and hug the world, right? Focus on three things maximum and deliver them well. So skills, schools, family. You know, we're doing incredible things on skills with T levels, with apprenticeships, with traineeships, and with what will be truly revolutionary is that the lifelong learning entitlement, and I'm going to find a better brand for it, um, where we stand behind you at any age in adulthood, where if you want to reskill or upskill, if you're in Aberdeen oil and gas and you think there's an opportunity for you in northeast offshore wind, we will stand behind you to the tune of £37,000, four years of post-18 education. Uh, you can take it as a whole or in modules, and we will deliver that for you. And then schools, the school's white paper we've been talking about. And the last one that is equally important is family. And we are launching family hubs 
in half of England's local authorities. The evidence is clear that multi-agency work with the most vulnerable, disadvantaged families makes a huge difference. If we can reach them through you know, needing a midwife if there's a pregnancy, mm. uh, vaccine if there's a birth, you can then add on top of it the early brain development for the baby, the early years work, um, the home learning environment, all these things where I saw the evidence when I went to Harlow with Robert Halfon when I was Children and Families Minister, we're now making it a reality. I got half a billion from Rishi to launch, between myself and Michael Gove, to launch family hubs in half of England's local authorities. Mm. You said this week you wanted to see the, the, maybe the positives of empire to be taught. Um, it, it, that's important to you. Yes, very much so. We should, I mean, we, we have to learn... Well, the both sides of it. All aspects of empire, both sides of it. Why do I say that? Because actually, you know, some people who may have not seen what my family's experienced, and I gave the example that in Iraq, the legacy of British mandate in Iraq was a great civil service that then the Ba'athists, the, the, the Saddam Hussein mm. and his ilk, dismantled and actually set the country back decades. And you talk to Iraqis today, they still hark back to a world where they had a civil service that was you know, the pride of the nation, that really delivered for, for, for people. And I think that's important for children to learn today that there were some really you know, important things that we did around the world that is a real legacy, as well as, of course, some of the less good things. How do you explain the cringe in institutions about the empire that, that you see all over the place, the, the reviewing of statues, the history, uh, the, the concern about it? It worries me deeply. It worries me that it's happening not just in the United Kingdom, it's happening in, in the US. You know, my, my two sons went to Princeton University and you know, they were shocked that you know, there's a movement to remove sort of Woodrow Wilson's name from the Woodrow Wilson School of Government. I think you don't become a better nation, a more cohesive community by denying the past, mm. um, removing the past. Half of Whitehall would have to be demolished mm. if, if you know, we, we... To explain we, the past? We, you explain the past and you, you have to explain both sides. There are some really you know, important things that happened that are great things that we you know, exported to the rest of the world, um, as well as the less good things. I think, and that's really important. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply uncomfortable with us beginning to view everything through the lens of 2022 when life was very different uh, in previous centuries and you know the values then were different i'm talking about you know the, the way the world operated was different uh, but you learn people, people are censoring shakespeare they're censoring I, I, you know, I, the language in 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 uh, 19th century books i mean i i just think when you come from a country where there was no freedom mm and very little opportunity, and you come to this great country, you just think we should celebrate. How do you feel about like this idea of st- calling, calling young people snowflakes? A lot of people in our generation call them snowflakes, and they're kind of worried about being offended by things. You're of all ministers, you're, you're thinking about them all the time. Are we, yeah. being, are we being unfair on younger people, our generation, to describe them as snowflakes, or are they just sensitive, more sensitive people? So I think they're not snowflakes, and i tell you for why, and I've got the evidence for it. Rachel D'Souza, the Children's Commissioner, in my first week as Secretary of State, said, can I show you some data? I said, you not only should be showing me the data, I want to come with you and launch it. And literally, we went together to one of the Harris schools and launched her big R survey. Half a million children she surveyed. Two and a half thousand children of Gypsy and Roma families. 16,000 children with SEND. These kids were resilient, right? They'd come through the COVID pandemic, the mistaken closure of schools they're not snowflakes at all they are really resilient and i think it's important to remember that so so a couple of things came out of it one they were incredibly resilient two wanted to be back at school right and i hear it on yeah. every school visit right children say the, the worst thing was not being back in school with my and you friends. call that a mistake didn't you just say big mistake is that your mistake? Whose mistake was that? Sorry, well, remind I, me again. I, think, I take government collective re- responsibility. I'm part of the government. Um, I think, and the Prime Minister would agree with me on this, that actually, you know, they should have kept them out. The way we dealt with uh, the pandemic, we have to learn from our mistakes. And I think actually school stayed open. And actually, I have 
and into the, the front line because of, of for but throughout the workers. Yes, of but course, actually, but for everybody, should, should, exactly that's your right. new position now. Exactly right. So one, they really wanted to be back at school, hugely resilient and understood that actually, you know, this is a pandemic and they've had to deal with it, but, but they, they thought it was a mistake to, to keep them out of school. The second thing is both the, the, the isolation of being out of school uh, had impacted their mental health. And so they, need, they wanted more support and well-being, which was important to them. But really important, I think, is they, they also felt there were some good things that come out from digital technology. For example, unlike you and I, you know, these children are digital natives. They would value a one-to-one session with a mental health expert mm. for that additional support that they might uh, need. And so I think there's, there's some good learnings from that but, but, that but, I can take away. They're resilient, but uh, are decision makers being over, overly protective, you know, putting uh, warning net notes on Shakespeare or something or warning about triggers from difficult literature? Is that, is that people being overprotective of people who don't need the protection? I think that those in a position of responsibility should be teaching young minds how to think, not what to think. Children can, if you teach them to be curious, if you teach them to understand how to filter and rely on quality journalism and understand both sides of the argument, Mm. then you'll be doing something truly great. Don't take your own, uh, you know, fears and prejudices into the classroom would be my, my mantra. Now, the good news is the majority of teachers are doing a phenomenal job in making sure those young minds are taught how to think, not what to think. Now, in saying that, because the first thing uh, you know, uh, I got back when I sent out my guidelines around political impartiality yes. uh, is you want people not, not to think about politics. That's not true. I will never turn down during election time a debate at one of my schools, right? But I want children to hear from the blue team and the red team and the Mm -hmm. yellow team and the green team because they need to hear all sides of the argument. They need to be able to themselves stress test arguments, right? We don't need to put warnings on things. Children can... And things like the N-word, the N-word in the To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, that is an appalling word, a shocking word. In context, it's still shocking now to read it. Of course it is. Of course. Children should read that. Uh, totally. I, 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 you know, I think it's really important that children are allowed to be able to be curious, but, but to understand, you know, where this stuff comes from, uh, rather than you create these sort of false filters for them. Now, quickly about some other non-education things, but thank you for your time today. Have you found the transition from vaccines to education? I mean, you did extremely well by getting the schools open on time with all those, that testing in... in um, yes. So you had a, a, literally a transition from your old job to your new job. And yes. how have you found it? I mean, it's, you're looking at kids like, like arms, I suppose, as you described it. There. It's incredible. I love the Department of Education. Uh, it's my third stint in the department. So I was sent to the department by the coalition, by David Cameron. Children's minister, were you? No, first, I, first, I was the apprenticeship czar. <laughs> right, you were czar. We had lots of czars in those days. And um, I was responsible for the apprenticeship standards and the levy and the sort of golden thread through the whole policy that carried on through uh, Theresa May and now to Boris Johnson is that you can't create standards in apprenticeship or a landscape in skills without co-creating it with business. And then I was the Children and Families Minister and now Secretary of State. So it's my third time in the department. I love the department. I w- walked in and I said, look, you know, I'm lucky because I have a department full of talented people, but also passionate people. And the combination of talent and passion, you can do a lot with. That's if you focus it, skill schools, families, and focus on operational competence and rigour, then you do great things for those young minds. Nadine Harvey, what is a woman? A woman is an adult human female. My favourite subject at school was human biology. It's a straightforward answer. It's a question of biology. Absolutely right. Does it matter? I mean, we shouldn't be talking about genitalia should be not even in the pub at 10 in the morning but i mean it's become this this it's dogging isn't it um, some politicians in in our in our political life and it really shouldn't and i tell you for why a couple of things one we have to make sure we protect uh, those who feel that actually their gender is 
female or male and it's right to protect them. We are a civilised society and you know, a sign of a civilised society is how it protects its minorities. Uh, and, you know, I would absolutely make sure that happens uh, in our education system or in the rest of mm-hmm. society. But you don't protect them by, in some way, um, being ambiguous, being, you know, unable to answer simple questions around sex. And I think that's important. The, the thing that slightly concerns me is, you know, we are a hugely tolerant society. My family are the beneficiaries of this incredible country, this tolerant society, is we don't want this debate to become nasty. No. It's not us. And all the trans, not trans people don't people. want to be part of a culture war. They just want to live their lives. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. And I don't... I'm not comfortable with this nastiness. You know, I, I just think, you know, we shouldn't be living in a world where you know, people who say exactly what I've just said, are then, you know, set upon. And young people, uh, and aren't, having, young people aren't, aren't having this debate. They are completely relaxed about it. Completely. I mean, it is a generational And that's the beautiful debate. thing about it, right? Mm. Is, is the, the great thing about our, our you know, values is we are an incredibly tolerant society. Of course, you know, there are, there are outliers. There are, there are people who, you know, behave badly. But we have a justice system that deals with that. Are you a tax-cutting conservative? Yes, I am, as is the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. The Chancellor, and I he never called himself one but this week. Well, I, I, th- I think the important thing to remember is that we've just come through a global pandemic, 407 billion. The Chancellor had ha- has had to uh, find to make sure we have that safety net, 40 million people protected uh, through furlough and the other schemes. We're now dealing with a global battle against inflation. And it is a global battle. Now, you know, what does that mean to your listeners? It means the, the weekly shop is more expensive. It means energy prices are volatile and therefore, at the moment, much more expensive. And I think he was right to bring forward 22 billion in one year, by the way, 22 billion of help, 9.1 billion towards energy and the balance is towards cost of living. Last Friday, the national living wage went up. Uh, that's another thousand pounds of people pockets but also setting out a very clear agenda as to how he's going to bring down taxes. So cutting tax... Uh, income tax in two years. Income tax from 20 p to, to lifting 19. Lifting the thresholds. I mean, lifting the thresholds is... Yeah. Is he in touch with, with, may I say, poor people? I mean, the criticism is he wears expensive shoes. Um, it's got quite personal about him and he can't quite understand how poorer people are living. Well, I don't believe that. I think that when you resort to personal attacks is when you've lost the argument. And I think the Chancellor... This is the Chancellor who... who literally in a week put together a package that you know the IMF said is the most comprehensive package that any nation that's dealing with the pandemic could deliver for their citizens he's put together a package for the next 12 months of 22 billion to make sure that that we help those that most need it if you look at what he's done with local government. So local government really know who those families are who are struggling to pay their utility bills, struggling with the weekly shop. He's doubled that help from half a billion to a billion. And he will always you know, make sure that he is on the side of the people uh, that are just about managing. And I think it's an unfair attack on the, on the Chancellor. But hey, it comes with, it goes with the territory. But when I think. will the tax burden start to fall? So... Look, it's an important target that we have to make sure we meet. The good news is the economy remains dynamic, right? You look at the inward investment. Only last week, the Prime Minister chaired a meeting with Australian investors, I think got 25 billion of investment in the United Kingdom. As long as we keep the United Kingdom as being the most attractive place in the world to invest, you'd be creating jobs. What does, what does that do? It gives opportunity. It delivers more taxes to the to the chancellor to be able to do more for so those people. Yeah. So productivity so growth is the answer. Will will give us the opportunity to be able to deliver on the promise of being a you know tax cutting conservatives. What do you think Johnsonism is? It is, I think, the spread of opportunity equally through the whole country. Talent is spread equally. I don't believe children in Knowsley are less talented than children in Kensington. It's the opportunity. They it's get. the opportunity. And if there's one thing that represents Boris Johnson is that spreading of opportunity around the country. You mentioned opportunity and local authorities earlier. 
Are you embarrassed about the government's slowness to bring in Ukrainians who want to come here? There's been 28,000 applications and just 2,500 visas issued so far. So there are two routes, as you know. The family route is you know, further ahead than the sponsorship route in terms of people already coming in. I've come from a meeting with directors of children's services to be with you. And we got, I think, three quarters of all directors of children's services on the Zoom call. They're already welcoming people in. Um, It's slow. Well, well, but remember, the family reunion was set up in a week, right? The sponsorship scheme was literally followed a couple of weeks after that. But I think the, the, the difference now is you're seeing a real acceleration of this. And as we did with the Afghan resettlement, as we did with the Hong Kong Chinese, 104,000 so applicants. It's a ski ramp. It will, it will absolutely ramp up. You mentioned the Afghan refugees. A lot of them are in hotels, getting quite depressed. They can't find homes. Why are we not offering a similar idea for, for Afghan refugees to come into homes of Britons? So some of them are in hotels. All Afghan children are in schools, and I'm okay. proud of that. Okay. But I think you know, we've got to make sure we the, the, the remaining Afghan refugees are in homes as quickly as possible. And we're working with our colleagues uh, in Deluxe and in the Home Office to make sure that happens. The Ukrainian situation in many ways required us to look creatively as to how do we create a, 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 a route other than the family reunion route that we had. And it's a scale bigger at the moment, which is why I think it's appropriate to do that. Critics say, I mean, it's a difficult conversation to have, and you come as a Kurdistan refugee, you might understand it, but critics say that we're showing more love for Ukrainians because they're from Europe and we're not doing it for I don't Af- believe I mean, it. I don't believe that. No, I, I, I'm so, I just think that that's a mistake. Um, the, the way we, we delivered for the Afghan resettlement programme, I certainly am very proud of. The way we, we've delivered for Hong Kong Chinese, 104,000 applications they are are going to be tremendous members of the community and the same will happen with with, with ukraine we have had a tradition in this country of being a very welcoming country to um, immigrants like my family or refugees now nadim zahabi you're less of a man than you were two years ago like i am i've lost some weight you because have. i've been concerned about about covid and how it might affect a man of my age and my size but i know in politics if you lose weight that means ambition do you want to be a leader? So you see this... I mean, just you and me talking. No one's right. listening. No one's listening. This is the bit where no one right, listens. Right, uh, On my lapel, there are two initials. <laughs> TL. TL. Not Tory leader. <laughs> not, it is... Not Tory T levels. T right. levels. I was going to ask you that. Why? Because my <laughs> obsession... Is, is to make sure I build runways. Now listen, you're, you're being a politician again. No. We're in a pub. No, have to do this I build anymore. runways for people's careers to take off on, Right. And not everybody needs to, or... or and your you know, runway is delivery. Know. Your runway yes. is vaccines and That's our schools. It. And this we're going to keep delivering. This is a platform for, we're for gonna the keep top de- job. Quite the opposite. I want as much time uh, in education. The average tenure of a Secretary of State in education is 17 months. If you take Gove and Blunkett away from that, it's even shorter. I'm hoping to break both of their records, uh, because if I can do this, this is real legacy stuff. For the country that gave this immigrant boy everything, if I can deliver, there's nothing more valuable on earth than human capital, right? Nothing. And if I can deliver young minds as healthy, skilled adults that live happy, productive lives, I'd have done something truly great for the country that's given me everything. And you haven't answered the question. I said not Tory leader. I answered your question. I answered your question. (laughs) And how do, you, how do you think history will judge Boris Johnson? The final question, because we are, we're two years, we're halfway through his first or last term as Prime Minister, if he goes to the next election, which may be in May 24. How will history judge him, do you think? I He's your think old friend, you've known him for ages. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I think he'll judge him as the most, in my view, consequential leader of his generation. If you go back to, I stood in 1997, Irith and Thamesmead. If you go back to Thatcher, Major... Blair, Brown, Cameron, May, Johnson. He had, he's had to deal with Brexit. He had to deal with a, a global pandemic. Come through that. Vaccine. Adult social care, which, you know, in all my time in the Conservative Party, 
governments of every colour have tried to deal with it and haven't delivered. This Prime Minister gripped that and is delivering against that. And then, of course, recovery. I think history will judge him as pretty much one of the most consequential Prime Ministers of his generation. Nadim Zahawi, thank you for joining us on Chuffers Politics. It's great to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nadim Zahawi there. Love to hear what you think about whether school children really are snowflakes and what's your view on taxes. Email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet me, I'm at chopperspodcast. Thank you to my guest this week, Education Secretary Nadim Zahawi and the Telegraph's very own Ben Riley smith Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wales, Giles Gear, and Theodora Luludis. And as ever, thank you to you for listening. Now for a daily Chopper's Politics Chaser before the podcast drinking session, you can sign up to my daily newsletter, bringing you Westminster Whispers every weekday straight into your email inbox. The link to sign up to that is in the show notes for this episode. And do be sure to check out my weekly Peterborough Diary column every Friday evening at 7pm on the Telegraph's website and in Saturday's newspaper. And on that point, please do always buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph if you can. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio!